Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Jill Kanopka in for Dennis House tonight. The Liberty Bank Surprise Squad went on a mission unlike any other they've done before. A large quantity of narcotics is now off the streets in Fairfield, and this morning an Easton couple is facing multiple drug charges. Southington police arrested 29-year-old Tyler Bulai Wednesday. They say the incident happened around 5.30 Wednesday night, right inside the Lake Compounds Water Park. Day two of a lengthy search turned up nothing as police and canines comb this area looking for additional clues. And an effort to extend workers' compensation coverage to police officers in the state suffering from mental health issues clears a key hurdle. Channel 3 New Haven Bureau Chief Matt McFarland has more now from New Haven. State police arrest a man they believe is behind a brutal attack at a horse farm in East Hampton. The killing of Cecil the lion not only is social media and animal advocates up in arms, but it has prompted Zimbabwe to make some policy changes. But they say Tyler Bulai is no longer welcome in the park ever again. Reporting with the Mobile Newsroom in Southington, Jill Kanopka, Channel 3 Eyewitness News. The body of 23-year-old Tashana Jackson was found in Bloomfield, but she disappeared from here in Hartford. And investigators at the police station say the suspect in this case was initially cooperating with them. He seems arrogant with his outbursts, no remorse. Emotions running high inside Hartford Superior Court today. He doesn't realize the impact that he's done on a family. 59-year-old Robert Graham faced a judge for the first time since being charged with the death and disappearance of 23-year-old Tashana Jackson, leaving family members, including her heartbroken mother and brother, distraught. He killed my sister. They know he did. He had a rape charge, a murder charge, and they still let him out now. Look what he did again. Police say Graham, a career criminal with rape and murder charges in his past, was last seen with the young mother late August 11th. After searches and a vigil, Jackson's badly decomposing body was found by relatives one week later behind this Bloomfield business. He threw her away like she was garbage, and that's how he needs to be locked up and throw away the key like he's garbage. That's what really hurts. That he, that he left her down. The guy is where he's supposed to be. We just gonna let the law do its process. As you can see that they're highly emotional. It's very upsetting. According to officers, Graham was discovered hiding out in his attic in Hartford. Eyewitness news cameras were rolling hours before cops made the arrest and returned him to Bloomfield. According to police and a witness in the warrant, Graham initially went looking for Jackson. A friend telling officers, quote, he had brand new shoelaces in his hands, a scratch on his neck, and chest and dirt on the bottom of his pants. He cooperated with the police. He went down to give a statement. He allowed them to search his vehicle. He allowed them to take his vehicles. He allowed them to search his house. Even changing his story, officers say to Jackson's roommate and them about her whereabouts and his damaged van found at his brother's home in Harford with part of the seat missing. There is a match between the DNA found in his car and the DNA of the deceased. Um, however, he has explained that away. He's been in a sexual relationship with her and um, and the affidavit states that they've had sex in the car. We should also mention what's interesting about this case is the autopsy is still pending and they need a few more weeks over at the medical examiner's office and also that the suspect in this case was never convicted of any murder charges. We'll have much more tonight on Eyewitness News at 6 o'clock. For now, reporting live at the Mobile Newsroom in Hartford, Jill Kanopka, Channel 3, Eyewitness News. The I-Team's Jill Kanopka shows us the 3D technology. It's a super sophisticated combination laser, computer, and digital camera. Use here in Naugatuck after a baby died in April. And in Plymouth for the suspicious death investigation of a little girl last October. Here in Torrington, it went to work for the murder of a mother in November. And in Bridgeport at a fatal stabbing last December. This is the PS20, uh, the Leica scan station. And it can recreate a scene virtually long after troopers have wrapped up their work on site. State Police Sergeant Mark Davison brought the device to Connecticut's law enforcement memorial at the police academy in Meriden to show us how it works. At a crime scene, the laser helps take millions of measurements important to investigators. And the digital camera snaps the scene in panoramic views. It's measuring a million points a second. Uh, it's taken 270 photographs per scan. Um, and all those points are measured relative to each other and to 
the position of the, of the machine in, in three dimensions. All that information then fed into a computer, which then takes all the data and puts it together in 3D. Investigators can then sit down at the computer and simply by clicking on a mouse, they can move around the crime scene. It's literally stepping right into it and walking through moving yourself around 360 degrees. And if you need to step outside, well, that's a possibility too. You can always step back inside to continue investigating, ultimately seeing the same perspective as the victim, potential witnesses, and even the killer. You're able to put people back in. It takes the questions out of, uh, and it out of you know what that what was what was seen and how it was seen ultimately what we always want to do is to be able to speak for the, the victims and for that can't speak for themselves any longer using this type of technology can help confirm witness statements you can actually find them to be credible and it backs their story up in terms of our ability to to analyze uh, and answer questions that that come up uh, that that is a very powerful tool and it'll be a force multiplier in terms of accomplishing those types of goals. And once detectives are finished with their investigation, prosecutors can use the Leica images in court to help present their cases, hopefully convicting a killer. And this provides an added dimension uh, in terms of our, our ability to memorialize the scene and then subsequent to that, uh, analyze it and then present the scene to a jury or to, uh, to, to court. Dennis, 60 to 70 police officers from New Britain, Weathersfield, Hartford, and Vermont, where Jaheem Snipe was caught, all came to court today showing their support for Officer Brett Morgan. And he is absolutely remorseless, absolutely remorseless, and doesn't have an ounce of regret over what he did to Brett Morgan's life. Dozens deep, a band of blue marched into New Britain Superior Court today in support of Officer Brett Morgan. 14 months to the day after 20-year-old Jaheem Snipe assaulted and dragged the rookie policeman responding to a stolen car call. He can no longer perform the essential functions of a police officer. So Brett Morgan has retired from the New Britain Police Department, but he is always part of the New Britain police family. The eye-rolling career criminal who appeared to stare down the New Britain state's attorney was sentenced to the agreed upon 20 years behind bars for his actions. It is certainly appropriate that you be incarcerated for a lengthy period of time. We are never going to forget Brett Morgan and Jaheem Snyder is going to spend the next two decades of his life in a cage seven feet by ten feet with another man not of his choosing, and he will be forgotten. Despicable conduct. Snipe's own words coming back to haunt him in a letter intercepted by DOC officials. Quote, expletive Officer Kelly and his partner that got ran over. Mr. Snipe, is there anything at all that you would like to say before the court imposes a sentence? No. Were we expecting it? No. Uh, if it happened, it would have been appreciated. But tonight, Snipes' attorney says that correspondence wasn't a true reflection of his client's attitude. I know, Mr. I'm sorry for his actions. Coming up tonight on Eyewitness News at 6 o'clock, we'll have more from this letter written by Jaheem Snipe. For now, reporting live at the Mobile Newsroom in New Britain tonight, Jill Kanopka, Channel 3 Eyewitness News. Actually, not that bad. He's a well-known community activist who cares deeply for Connecticut's capital city. Pull it right out. And I put the hand here. Yep. the safety. Crusading against crime with his mother's United Against Violence. Reverend Henry Brown has led marches and peaceful protests, working closely with Hartford Police. I'm just hoping that I can hold myself accountable and do a good job. Occasionally, though, Brown has been critical of officers' actions. Tensions around the country have recently called into question how police react in life or death situations. The Reverend agreed to trade places with police to see things from their side, accepting our invite to participate in use of force training at the Harper Police Academy. There will be lethal and less lethal exposure to our weapons platforms. Um, you don't have any experience in that. Choose the best you can based on what you see. I'm ready. All suited up. Domestic call. Domestic call. Reverend Brown makes his way to a mock apartment where emotions are running high. Hello. Whoa, whoa. Who called the police? Hello. Who called the police? What the police is doing here? You need to calm down, sir. I am completely calm. Do you have a weapon? 
Do I have a weapon? Yeah, do you have a weapon? That's none of your business. That I have the right to carry a gun. Second so, Amendment. Yeah. You have a weapon? Oh, you need to put your hand. Gun, you need to put your hand where I can see him, sir. Could you gun. take a seat, sir? I'm not going to take a seat. You, you need to take a seat. Brown got shot several times, but never returned fire. Oh, this is crazy. Everything is happening so super fast. You know, he's yelling, she's yelling. It's chaotic. I guess you have to be trained for that. The next several scenarios involve the police department's use of force simulator. You got a full surround sound system. It's going to make the bangs of gunfire. A necessary training tool for officers that the police chief says cost almost $100,000. Based on how you act, the scenario can change. For the first scenario, Reverend Brown is being dispatched to Edna. You see a gentleman that's doing some suspicious behavior. You need to put that down. I ain't got to put that down. Why? Sir, you need why to put that down. What? Why are you hassling me? If that's your bag, why do you need colors? The climate changes when the Reverend gets a redo. Put him down. Look, whatever. You don't need that. The second time, you took a weapon system out and you gave him orders to put the gun down, and what do you do? You you got, I don't want to be a cop. No, geez. <laughs> Raise your other hand. In another simulator scenario, Brown is dispatched to a burglar alarm at an hey, industrial complex in the middle of the night. Let me see your hands. Okay. Put your hands where I can see it, man. Put your hands up. You want to see my idea? Got it. I want to see your hand. Put your hands where I can see it. Reverend Brown fires three shots at the suspect who turns out was aiming a staple gun in his direction. Why'd you shoot him? I had to. I don't want to live. I don't want to die. You know, so I didn't want to shoot him either, but I had no choice. The suspect's gun wasn't real. I thought it was a gun. I didn't have no choice but to react. The officer had to make a split second decision. And after his experience, Reverend Brown says he feels humbled after learning so much. I learned today that you have to do what's appropriate. You know, after all, you want to go home to your family. My goodness. It's really something when you see that. It was very eye-opening. And, you know, what we learned as well, compliance is absolutely key. Here's Channel 3's Jill Kanopka, who broke the story of her death. My soulmate, my, my wife, uh, my best friend. Mike Gann is thankful to have spent four decades with the love of his life, introduced to his bride Judy by her identical twin sister Joyce long ago. We both liked cars, we both liked music, you know, what I call maybe family values. And they wanted to start a family. At the time, we didn't know if we'd even be able to have children. Miraculously, they had a son, John, followed by daughter, Maggie. She was just incredible. I mean, especially coming from a perspective that I'm a mom now. You know, you really get that full perspective of what your parents do for you. Maggie recently became a mother herself and is sad her daughter will never get to meet her grandmother, a longtime educator who adored children, including her two older granddaughters. I know she's still with me and she's still with my brother and you know sometimes we see her and our kids. The 64 year old Gan died after mouth surgery in February of 2014. Enfield police charged her dentist, Dr. Rashmi Patel, with negligent homicide and tampering with evidence one year later. Judy's widower and daughter aren't ready to discuss details of her death just yet. I can't imagine it's been easy for you. Um, no, it hasn't. And like I said, it's, it's half of my life was, was basically, uh, is basically gone now. For now, they're making sure Judy is remembered for the way she lived her life. She knew the, every kid by name, every kid in the school. She would give those kids her all, all her empathy, mm -hmm. uh, guidance, uh, went way above and beyond her job description as a, as a school librarian. She always rooted for the underdog. Although most of the time, Gan says his wife's students were more interested in what Judy was wearing. Evidenced by this framed wall art the couple has had hanging at home for more than 25 years. The child wrote, uh, the library teacher is fun. Her name is Mrs. Gann. She has blonde hair and she wears pretty, pretty clothes. <laughs> Every time she looked at it, she'd smile, you know. In keeping her memory alive, this year Judy's family established the Judy Gann Memorial Scholarship at Ellington High School, where the couple lived for more than 25 years. We wanted to place an emphasis on, uh, on uh, her love of children and having that live on. Um, as well as uh, as well as her life. She was their advocate, and I think this scholarship is is exactly 
what she would have wanted. One week ago today, they presented the award to the first recipient, a graduating senior who plans on majoring in either library science, literature, or music. Judy's three loves. When they were reading the uh, the tribute, um, you know, a lot of things came came flooding back mm -hmm. to me, um, sort of a flashback of her her life in, in my mind. Um, and then, uh, you know, and then we were able to walk up and, like I said, present the award. Both Mike and Maggie say they feel Judy's presence and guidance constantly. It's always the radio. Like when we pulled in last Thursday for the um, scholarship ceremony, um, I was like, oh, Mom, I hope you're, you're with us. And as I was turning the corner to the auditorium, the song I sang at my high school graduation came on the radio. Billy Joel's These Are the Times. She didn't look back. She didn't try to try to be anybody but who she was and she was always true to that and I hope that my daughter has that confidence. Jill Kanopka, Channel 3 Eyewitness News.